Hey everybody, Dr. Barron here with virtualheadachespecialist.com. There's been a ton of questions in the comments about hemiplegic migraine, so I want to talk about that today. Uh, also known as migraine with motor aura, which is a more common term for this, but same thing essentially. And the International Headache Society says that the diagnosis is based on having a requirement of a migraine headache with aura. Um, you can look at the pinned videos up top for the criteria for migraine headaches as well as for aura symptoms and what those are. But basically aura, you have to have either visual aura, sensory aura, or speech language aura with the migraine headache. And with that attack, you get weakness on one side of the body. This can be face, arm, leg, uh, individually, any of those places or the whole side. And by criteria, that weakness can actually last up to 72 hours, three days. Uh, there are rare cases where uh, it's been reported to go several weeks. Most commonly, it might last much shorter than three days, usually you know a few hours. Um, but it can last much longer than a regular aura. The, the duration of a regular aura, visual, sensory, and speech, is up to 60 minutes max. Uh, so motor aura can go beyond that. Um, and so uh, the cause of this, the cause of aura in general, um, just to review, is that you have this electrical wave that spreads across the outside of the brain called the cortex, just a few millimeters thick. Um, but it spreads across that cortex, depending on where it spreads, determines the type of aura you have. So the most common type of aura is visual aura. Um, and this happens because the most common area of spread is actually across the cortex of the brain in the back, which is called your occipital cortex. Uh, if that wave spreads across the sensory cortex of the brain, then you get sensory symptoms, numbness, tingling on one side. If you get spread across the speech or the language centers of the brain, you get language or speech dysfunction as an aura. Uh, and then if that wave spreads even further forwards in the brain, which is less common, that's where it can spread across the motor cortex of the brain, and that's where you get weakness on one side of the body. Um, so that's essentially what causes the aura. Um, the treatment of migraine with aura, hemiplegic migraine, migraine with brainstem aura, which used to be called basal or artery migraine. I'll talk about that separately. Um, but the treatment is all essentially very, very much the same, except for a few minor things. So if the headache is frequent enough or the attacks are frequent enough, uh, having a preventive therapy uh, to try to lessen the frequency of attacks, lessen the uh, effect on your function in your life if it's happening and it's really disruptive to life, uh, always a preventive medicine is a good consideration. And abortively, every patient with migraine needs to have an effective abortive option. So abortively, um, you know, the, the one thing that we often try to avoid in hemiplegic migraine is the triptans and DHG or the ergots. And the reasoning for this is uh, because when the triptans were studied initially back in uh, the late 80s, um, the theory of migraine at that time was based on the vascular theory of migraine. So you probably have heard this term vascular headache which were usually referred to migraine in the past. Uh, and the thinking at that time was that migraine aura was caused by this narrowing, this constriction of a blood vessel to part of the brain, and it led to the aura symptoms, which can look like stroke and TIA. And after that uh, vessel opened back up, it actually overdilated, and you get this rebound, throbbing, pounding pain. So both of these have been since disproven. Uh, we know that know that a, a migraine event is an electrical event uh, primarily, um, but the concern was that if you gave a triptan, and because triptans and DHG cause narrowing of the arteries to a small extent, and if you narrowed these arteries that are, were already narrowed according to that older theory, you could lead to a true stroke. Uh, and so when these studies were done on the triptans uh, a long time ago, these patients were actually excluded, hemiplegic migraine, uh, basilar migraine, uh, because of this theoretical risk that there would be stroke if you gave these patients these medications. So 
you know, that has since really been disproven as far as the, 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 the source of the aura being now electrical rather than vascular. But there's also some theoretical concern that, you know, when you have the aura, what happens, uh, that front wave is very activating. It's, it's, uh, it's stimulating the neurons that it passes by. So this is why if it spreads across the visual cortex, for example, you get positive features of aura. So these are flashing lights, colors, zigzag lines, fortification spectra, kaleidoscope, all this kind of stuff. Um, if it spreads across the sensory cortex, you get tingling, uh, etc. And so after this wave passes by the area of the brain that it is overstimulating, you end up following that wave, what's called neuronal depression. This is where those neurons are actually underactive. They're uh, in kind of disarray. They've been overstimulated, you know, kind of exhausted their stores, and now they're just not doing much. Um, and this is where you get the negative features of aura. So you get black spots or lost vision, numbness. Uh, these are what we call negative features of aura. And so when you have this area of spreading depression where the neurons are not as active at that time, they are not using much glucose, they're, they're not metabolizing correctly. And so the result is that they don't need much blood flow or glucose because they're just not metabolically active at that point. And so the thinking is that if you give a tryptan or an ergot to patients and you decrease the blood flow to this already limited area of blood flow because the neurons are not functioning metabolically, perhaps that could leave, lead to a stroke. Um, so this is debatable, but that's really a concern. Uh, and essentially what it comes down to is medical legal concern because these patients just haven't been studied um, for clarity of safety uh, in trials because they were initially excluded from those trials. So that's really the, the main thing to keep in mind. Um, but, you know, again, having a good abortive uh, is key. And so, you know, luckily we have the G-Pants now, which are, they have no vascular effects. The Ditens, um, you know, the Ditens is a uh, Ravow. The G-Pants are things like uh, Ubralvi, Nurtec, Zafspret. And, uh, you know, there, there's other options like NSAIDs and these kind of things, which I know a lot of patients with migraine don't do great with those medicines. But um, we try to avoid tryptans. Uh, there are certainly patients that use tryptans that have, have hemiplegic migraine. They do fine. You know, we see it all the time. You know, sometimes I, um, I, I'm okay with that. Um, but, you know, if they're on estrogen or, you, you know, definitely we would not want to use tryptans. So we try to use it as a last resort, essentially. All right, guys. Uh, if you have other questions about it, uh, feel free to drop them in the comments. All right. See ya.